my subject is the passion man. The Bible is a mystery to be known only by revelation. You can sit down and think about it and rationalize and not be able to tell it. If it is not revealed in you, you will not know it. And the majority of the teachers of the world take the traditions of men and teach it as fact. And so we jump into our Bible with these preconceived misconceptions of the great revelation of God to man. But the Bible is taken to the path of man. Anyone who has heard of Jesus Christ, think of it as a man. Jesus is not a man. He is the man. The only man. Who is buried in every child born of woman. And who will rise in every child born of woman. And when he rises in us, then we and the Lord Jesus Christ are one. He comes only to fulfill Scripture. Man knows, building on this world of ours, perfectly all right, that he does. He's encouraged to do it. But the story of Jesus is to fulfill Scripture. That I have come only to fulfill Scripture. Scripture must be fulfilled in me. And beginning with Moses and the law, and the prophets, and the Psalms, he interpreted to all, all the things concerning himself. For the scripture was not the New Testament, it was only the Old. So when you spoke of the scriptures, in that day you only had one scripture, and that was the Old Testament. So the Old Testament was a prophecy. And the new fulfilled, and he is the new. So he is the pattern man in every child born of God. So he's not a man, he is the man. The perfect man. And this perfect pattern awaits us and unfolds in us. Now we are told in the last chapter of Zechariah. The Lord will become king over all the earth. And in that day, the Lord will be one. And his name, one. If you are born into the family of the Browns, you automatically, regardless of the name given, you are a Brown. So you may be given the name of John, but nevertheless, you are John Brown. If you are born into the family, whose name is Brown. But all of being born into the one body whose name is Jesus. So in the end, everyone will be Jesus. For in that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. You will not lose your identity. I will know you in this world of season. I will know you by the Lord name, a friend of yours. But in the end, when you are born in the body of Jesus, you are still the John that I know here, but you are Jesus. And I will see you and see you as Jesus. For there is only in the end, only one man, the perfect man, the pattern man, and that man is Jesus. And Jesus and the Lord God Jehovah are one. There are two gods, there are two lords, there is only one God. Only one body. Only one spirit, only one hope, only one God and Father of all. And I know it seems strange to many who have not had the experience, because they've been trained to me, and you can't blame anyone. I came out of a family of Christians, and they speak in their Christians. And I'm quite sure that my family is a very shop for young men to hear me say what I'm now saying. I know this past year in Barbados, discussing with my sister. And she claimed as I'm saying, or was saying, but this is before the vision. And before the vision, certainly I believe in Jesus as a man. 
trained as many Christians, the world we lived in was a man, brought of a woman who knew not a man, in some strange, miraculous manner. And then came the vision, the actual experience, of the mystery of Christ. As Pope tells us, in his letter to the world, great indeed, he confessed, is the mystery of our religion. For well, if it's a mystery, then it isn't history. For history is certainly not a mystery. For history is based upon facts. And that's no mystery. Whether you admit or you like the facts or not, they are facts. So there's no mystery to the facts of life. I mean, the Bible is based upon secular history, but it's not a mystery. But Paul, he a great indeed, we confess, is the mystery of our religion. And he uses the word mystery no less than 20 times in his letters. He said, and God has made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to his purpose, which he set forth as a plan in Jesus Christ for the fullness of time. So when the time is full in you, in everyone, that plan erupts. And everything said of him in Scripture, which you are taught to believe, was secular history, proves itself in you to be supernatural history. It's a history of salvation. You are saved by that pattern, that perfect pattern. So he was born in a supernatural manner. You will be born in a supernatural manner. And if his name was Jesus, you remain the same John or Mary, whatever your name is, but you are Jesus by reason of that birth. For you are born supernatural. It comes so suddenly, it comes so unexpectedly. You don't look forward to it because you were not taught to believe that you were this way. You were taught to believe that sometime in eternity, if you were a good person in the eyes of Him, who is your Savior, that then He would decide whether He would save or not. But not a thing on the outside would help. Nevertheless, you depend upon His grace, whether He was saved. But all of a sudden, you discover that He was in you all along. And the whole story of Christ is that in man as a pattern. But it can't erupt in man until a certain moment in time. At that moment, nothing can stop it. And you may be on a journey at the moment, and certainly not speaking of this, when suddenly the whole thing unfolds within you. And the drama takes the same time as mentioned in Scripture. It takes 1260 days as told us in Scripture. In the last chapter of Daniel, a book written 600 years B.C. And Daniel said, how long to the end of these wonders? Now, now a statement is made as to when you begin to come. But how long will it be to the end of these wonders? And he who stood above the water, he said to him, a time, times, and half a time. And the ancient company of time was a year, and a year to the ancient world was 360 days. They divided the 360 days by 12, that is, 12 periods of 30 days. Then a half of that would be the half of a time, which would be 180 days. So a time was a year, times two more years, and then a half a time. But you multiply it. Add it up, and you will see it comes to 1,260 days, as told us in Revelation. The 11th chapter of Revelation. And my witnesses will come and prophesy for 1,260 days. For well, this erupted in me on the 20th day of July, 1959, in this city of San Francisco. On the sixth day of December was the second eruption of the same year, 59. On the eighth day of April of 1960 was the third eruption. And then on the first day of January of 1963 was the fourth eruption. When you add from the 23rd of July, 1959, to the first day of January, 1963, and you'll see it comes to 1,260 days, right to the day. I had no idea that scripture was so literally true, but not on this level. For the first was certainly not a physical purpose. Yet I was taught as a child of belief 
that Jesus is birth was a physical birth, and they came from some physical section of time and place to find a little physical child. But in reading scripture after the event, you see the whole thing was a drama taking place not on earth, but taking place in heaven. For he is made to say, I am not of this world. You are from below, I am from above. You are of this world, I am not of this world. So he's telling you in the most graphic manner what takes place in man. For he is the pattern, the pattern of a new man that unfolds, that takes the man from this world and puts him into an entirely different world called by men the kingdom of heaven. Until you are born from above, you cannot in any manner enter the kingdom of God. And you don't require it. It's all by grace. But that grace was in the beginning. For he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. So we're all chosen in the one body. The one body spread out for a deliberate purpose. And we contain within the one body when the time is fulfilled and the body begins to erupt to fulfill its purpose. You and I are born in this manner. And we discover the fatherhood of God in this manner. We discover the section of the tone part of the temple in this manner. And then we find the complete satisfaction of what is taking place in us when the dove descends upon us individually. But you read in the story as something that took place 2,000 years ago, and there it stopped. And we are on the outside, hoping in some strange way through our efforts, that he will see our efforts, and then add them all together, and that we will acquire merit, and that he will save us because of acquired merit. You cannot, by any effort on your part, bring about this bread or paint the kingdom of God. It's all grace, 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 and still more grace. So we are told that grace and truth comes through Jesus Christ. But grace is God's gift of Himself to man. That's grace. People think of grace as something else, but actually, in the scriptures, the word grace, which so much is said today, that He has to live by. He spoke of the charities as charismatic. They were those who had charisma, meaning that a peculiar spiritual force seemed to have moved them. Well, charis is the root of the word grace, means a gift from God. And God's gift to man is God himself. God becomes man, that man may become God. So that's God's gift. What greater gift could he give me than himself? Well, he gives me the ultimate, that's himself. So he died by becoming me. He has to empty himself of his glory to take upon himself the limitation of this slave. And he wears this slave throughout a number of generations. For I didn't begin in my mother's womb. And I do not end in the grave. You and I began a number of generations ago. But at a moment in time, predetermined by he who gave himself for us, we erupt. And erupting, we find that we are So God became as I am, with all my weaknesses, with all my limitations, that I may become as He is, without weakness, without limitation, free beyond measure. And without this static love, they could not work. He could not mold us from without and make us what He desired to make us. He had to enter us. So we are the grave which God has made. God himself entered the tomb, which is man. And he laid down in that tomb with me, and shared with me my vision to return, until I awake and see Jesus. And Jesus is what then I become. For so everything said of him, as if he erupts again, you experience. You don't hear it coming from without. You actually experience it. So you're talking to him from then on, from experience, not from feeling. You don't speak to it. If he was born to a and you are born to a God, if the infant child is brought to you as a sign of your birth, as it was brought in the case as we call it in Scripture, and if there are witnesses there, you recall this birth. The child was not the thing born. The child was the evidence of something that was born. God was born. So you're told in Scripture, and this shall be a sign unto you. What sign? You shall 
find a way not in swallowing trouble, barring in the danger. So they are in haste, and they are found just as it was built. They are found what? The sign of a bird. The child wasn't the thing that was born, that is the symbol of a bird. Or what was born? Man was born as God. Or you're told, and that thing, the word is called thing, that thing which shall be born of you, shall be called holy, the Son of God. So when you are born, then that is the thing. But how do I know that I'm born for God? I felt the whole thing coming from outside. There was no that a whole head exploding, and something is coming out, and I'm coming out, out of a grave. But within about a moment, here comes the child. Here comes this infant wrapped in swaddling clothes, placed in your hands, with the same heavenly smile as the old inscription. And then the whole thing dissolves. On the heels of that, a few months later, comes the discovery of the fatherhood of God. And this is the most fantastic thing. Because when it happened to me, I could hardly believe this thing that I had gone off my mind. I don't know if I tried to me, but a normal matter that I did night after night. And here this night, my head begins to explode, and you feel it explode. And you wonder, is this the last moment in time for me? Is this what we both call some massive hemorrhage? Not having had anything wrong with my head prior to this. You entertain this thought because the whole thing is just simply intensified. And your head becomes more and more vibrant, and you can't arrest it. You can't stop it and defeat it in intensity. And when it reaches the apex of intensity, there's an explosion. And all of a sudden, it's going to be born. It's the baby, not a baby, but the baby of biblical faith. And you look at him, and you know he is your son. And he knows you are his father. And they are admiring and bringing the beauty, sheer beauty. You can't describe the beauty of David. People have tried to paint it. There is a sculpture called the David. It can't come later, the David, that living reality that comes before you. But who is it? In scripture, Jesus said, He called me Father. Well, Jesus tells us in the scripture that I am the Father. He who sees me sees the Father. How do you say, show me the Father? Have I been with you this long? You do not know me, God. He who has seen me has seen the Father. And if I am a Father, there must be a Son. And then where is my Son? And here comes David to fulfill Scripture. For it only comes to fulfill Scripture. For the prophecy was that these are the words in the mouth of David. And the Lord said unto me, Thou art my Son. Today I will be done. Read it in the second psalm. A psalm written 1,000 years BC. And these are the words of David. Of the 89th psalm. And the Lord now comes upon David. I have found David. And he is cried of me, Thou art my God, my God, and the rock of my salvation. So here you find yourself fulfilling scripture. And here, as you read the gospel, he said, I only here to fulfill scripture. He didn't raise one thing to change the world of Caesar. He knew that everyone born of woman was enslaved by the body that they were born. You could be born in a castle or born in a house. You are a slave of the body that you wear because of the ambitions of that body, the desires of that body. If you wear it for 10 years or a thousand years, you get up in the morning and you bathe it and you shave it and you feed it, and then you allow all the normal functions of nature to take place, and you are a slave of it. It is in pain, you are in pain. And whatever it can do, you are in a slave of it. So he knew that even though one called himself a pharaoh or a king, and one was slave, all were slaves of the body that they bore. He made no effort to change the world of Caesar. Whose point is this? Caesar. Well, when you are the Caesar, the things of the Caesar. He's not concerned about that. He's only concerned about the kingdom of heaven. The new birth that was set for him free. But no matter how long I live and how much I hold as, as things in this world, I'm still a slave, a slave of the things. The day you buy a tree, you pay a rent from then on. Let someone give you a table, and you accept the gift, and from then on you buy someplace, or pay rent someplace to house the table. You are 
it in a way, or when you cannot use it any longer, you put it in storage and take away from it. You buy one thing in this world, and from then on, you are a slave. And he knew that. And so he brought freedom to the world. And the freedom comes with a second birth. And that birth is the birth from above, not the birth from below. Everyone born from the womb of woman is a slave. And everyone born from the skull of man, by man I mean generic man, is set free. And that is told us in all levels to the duration. So we have two mothers. One is Hagar, who bears children into slavery. And one is Jerusalem, or self in scripture, and she bears them into peace. One is from above, and one is from behind. So no matter who you are, how wealthy you are, how strong you are, as a body, it's still a slave. But when you are born from above, when you take off this garment for the last time, you immediately take on that immortal garment, the body of glory. For you in the body of Jesus. So he is not a man. As the Christians believe, and pray to a man on the outside, he is a good man. But the man who is crucified in us, and who rises in us individually, one after the other. And when he rises, he is set free. So he rises in me, and I am And my name must be one. For in the end, the Lord's name is one. Not two. So I will be of the body of Jesus, one body, and of the name of Jesus, before the name of Jesus, yet I'll be heaven. You will know me, know me as heaven, but you will know me as Jesus. I will know you as speech or ministry or any other name, but I will know you as Jesus after you are born from God. Because scripture must be fulfilled, for the word of God cannot be broken. So we are told, do not add to the words of God, do not take from the words of God, even just as they are. But throughout the centuries, our scholars, in translating, they bring their own prejudice to the Bible, and they insist. That's why it is essential that year after year, new editions must come out. You see, we could have these zealous people, have been carried away by their own preconceived misconceptions, and incorporated that misconception into Scripture. And you'll find it time and again. So it always calls for a new edition to delete these misconceptions. But even then, those who are called upon to do the job, they'll bring their misconceptions in. But after the eruption takes place in man, it's all by vision. So you don't need to know what they say. It's what is taking place in you, and you didn't do it from The whole thing happened. And so you didn't sit down to compose some vertical block of your life. The thing just happened. But if it happens in this way, but then you tell it. So you relate your own experience. If it doesn't fit your concept, first of all, you relate your own experience. But you will find that the same pattern will be followed by everyone who is born from above. So you are on very solid ground. You tell it, and if the whole vast world rises out in the it doesn't matter. You tell it. Record it if you will. But leave it as a record, as a witness. For we all call upon to witness the truth of Scripture. Now there must be two witnesses if my witness. Evidence is to hold water. If you're not two, it's to not four. But when two different persons agree in testimony, it is confusing. And so I tell my story and go on record and put it into written form. And then you have an identical experience. And through that, then you and I are the two witnesses. Can we find scriptural support for our experience? I then search the scriptures. And I find in the scriptures support for what is happening to me. So I have the external witness of the Word of God, the written Word of God. So I have the internal witness of the living Word of God as it unfolded within me. Parallel in that which is the external Word of God. Then what does it matter what the world will judge? What does it matter what anyone will judge? I can only say to anyone, you wait. God is merciful and patient. And in his own good time, he will unfold it within. It may come this way. It may come before the evening goes. Who knows? It comes like a thief in the night. But it has nothing to do with any external behavior on the part of a man. You can go to church every day of your life. You can go to church and give to the poor and do all the things on the outside. It has nothing to do with the moment of election. You can this night be coming to a bar and be drinking until you can't even see clearly. 
and that night may be the night that he who doesn't judge your human behavior erupts within you. Because in the end, all things are forgiven. The last cry on the cross, Father, forgive. They know not what they do. A man is called to believe, I must conform to what man believe is the right thing. And so unless I do that, then I'm punished. They think of a God who punishes. They can't believe scripture that God is infinitely merciful. I mean, infinite mercy, not just a little bit of love. You stand in His presence, the risen Lord, and His infinite love. And yet you know when you are drawn into His presence by a power that you cannot resist, that you are capable of the unnumbered, unholy things that men do. And you know that you've done them. And you still do, you could continue to do them. And yet in His presence, you ask one simple little question that is asked to you. You answer as though you are divine in God. He embraces you. And you fuse with the body of the risen Lord and become one body. From then on, you are that body. And those whose eyes are open spiritually, when they meet you, they meet you and see you as that being. I have had that experience a number of times from those whose eyes spiritually are open. On this level, yes, but it's what I am. Weak man, capable of all the silly little things in me, are capable of. Yet, when the body sees, and he who is awake within the week, they see that man. And that's the man that I will, when this body talks for the last time, will be the immortal being. For that being has been awakened within me. And I am not unique. I am one of every child born and born. Regardless of race, regardless of religion, regardless of anything, we are all one in one body, and that body is the man, the pattern man. And the pattern man is the Lord Jesus Christ, who is God Himself. He is not some little thing that is the universal God, who is crucified on man. Not on a little piece of wood, where the churches of the world have taken pieces of wood to show you the cross that was His. Why, as the writer said, Mark Twain said, he fell across the world. And when the different churches and all the priests held him, that is the Protestant priests, the Catholic priests, and all the others, pieces of wood that came from the cross, where he took his death on the cross, he could build a house. He had a man carried it. A man called Simon, a normal man, carried the cross for two. If he carried that cross, he but just undertook the house. For every church that he visited across Europe had a piece of the wood from the cross. They all had a piece of the cloth that he wore, the robe. Put it all together, he would have six clothes and on, a huge arm. That was what he wore. So everyone with their little, silly little things to enslave the minds of men. But this is a mystery. This has got a thing to do with human history. It is divine history. It is the history of salvation. And God actually became that. And God's only name, he was told me in scripture, is I am. And the word Jesus, if you break it down to its actual root, is I am. It begins Yod Hey Bob, which is the beginning of the name Jehovah. Yod Hey Bob A. And that's how you spell Jesus in Hebrew. The word Jesus in Hebrew is Joshua, Yeshua. That is the name. And it is the same name as you spell Jehovah. So the Lord God Jehovah is I am. Go and tell them I am the Savior. That is my name forever. And by this name I shall be known throughout all generations. So can you say I am? That's God. But you don't know it because it has been rubbed in you. But that's God. That's God in there. And I walk the earth, but I lose my memory. I do not know who I am, who I am. I know I am, because I can't stop looking, I am, and that is not. And the day will come the pattern, the perfect pattern that was buried, used to in the beginning. Well, you are, that is seed in us. But you are told that mystery of the seed is that a seed except it falls to the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it brings forth the mind. So he fell the great seed, the great word of God, which is God himself. 
cleanses himself in us, containing within himself the pattern, the plane of salvation. And so, as, as the plane comes to its fullness of time, it's us, an erupting in us. It's not something we observe from the outside, we are experiencing on the inside. We are actually going through this experience in the first person present. We are the main actor in the drama. Here, may I tell you, Jesus is the only real. But everyone who me, the one they know he is Jesus. In the sleep, he doesn't know it. And because he sleeps, he has a nightmare. And he kills his brother. He steals from his brother. And therefore he steals it from himself. For there is no other. Every time I've thought and planned to take from a seeming other, for my own personal gain, I'm simply robbing myself because there is no other. There is no other. For so there's only Jesus. So in the end, when they looked up and their eyes were open and the brain began to completely explode, they looked and it was Jesus only. Nothing but Jesus. So when people say, I have another way to God, forget it. There's only one way to God. If I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes unto the Father except by me. You can't go to the Father and find the Father unless you go to the pattern man, which is Jesus. That pattern I will impose within you or you'll never find the Father. But if you rock within you, here, you know you are the Father because the Father's only begotten Son is calling you Father. And yet you're a man walking this earth with all the weaknesses of man. But you are not in eternity to see the Father. For the Father is not seen by anyone but the Son. No one has ever seen the Father, but the Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, is made you know. So that no one knows who the Son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son. And anyone whom the Son chooses to reveal, to when the Son is clothed within you, and the dove settles and he stands before you, then you know who you are, you are the Father. For the Son calls you Father. And you know the relationship, there's no doubt, no uncertainty in your mind as to this relationship between you, the Father, and the Son called David. So you see that David is not a physical being. And people expect that David is some physical being that lived 1,000 years BC. And that he had this, that, and the other. It is, David is an eternal state, a spiritual state. And I'm speaking of a spiritual God, not a physical God. We're passing through what we think is a real world. This is a shadow world. A world where we are banished. But if one you understood the symbolism of Scripture, we are banished for 400 years. Well, it's not 400 years that you and I made a time. 400 is the numerical value of the 22nd, which is the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And that last letter has the symbol, the cross as its symbol. The thing is, take that's the last letter. 22nd letter of the Hebrew alphabet is stoke. Its symbol is a cross. Its numerical value is 400. So I will banish you for 400 years while you wear the cross. As long as we wear these crosses that are saved, we are done the journey. Then I bring you up and set you free and give you this beyond your wildest dream. Because he will give you himself. But you must first go in to save you. That was shown me so vividly in a vision of mine. I came upon a scene, the most glorious scene of flowers. There were huge sunflowers, but the flower was not a flower, it was a human face. They were all rooted in the ground, beautiful sunflowers. If one moved, they all moved in concert. If one smiled, they all smiled. If one bent over, they all bent over. And I, walking among them, I knew in spite of my weakness and my limitation, that I at that moment enjoyed a greater sense of freedom than all of them together. They had not gone out. They were in a state of infinite joy and peace and innocence. They had not gone through the story of experience. And the whole journey is from innocence to experience to awakened imagination. That's the journey of man. So you must come out of the state of innocence and enter this world of experience and it's a cherished world. It's a world of fear where everything dies. No matter how long it is, it dies. 
the stars die, everything dies in this world. So we enter the world of death, wearing a cross, which is the cross of the slave. And then we are brought out by this pattern man, erupting within us. And then having gone through the experience, we are immortal beings. But this time, fully awake, not just all angels and beautiful flowers who move in concert. We are individualized and yet one body. We do not move in concert because of reason to work in concert, but we are still individuals. But they are not individuals. They are all one brain being moving together. I saw it so big in this time. So you and I who came out, it's a story of the prodigal son. The first one didn't come out. But he didn't know he had all of the power of the The father said to him, but my son, all that is mine is your life. But he didn't know. He was envious of the second one who went out and wasted his money and came back to find everything in abundance. The robe, the ring, the staff, and the cutting down. He said, this your brother. He was dead and he's alive. He was lost and he's done. You were never left, my lord. You were never lost. You hadn't died. One must die if you may alive. The mystery of life through death. So you and I who were chosen in his body in the beginning of time before the foundation of the world. Then he fell, bringing all of us with him. A deliberate fall. And then we were fragmented and started on our individualization. And then we have gone through all that we had to go through. Then he rubs in us. And we and he are one. Mighty Balabite, and set your hope to me upon the eruption within you. And I hope that in the not distant future, it happens in you, all of you, individually. Because no matter what you have heard in the past, no matter what you have experienced in the past concerning the world of season, it fades into nothing. It fades into nothing. But when people say to me, yes, someone told me that they are friend of my left, my last meeting night she was there. And she was sitting in a little Mexican restaurant down in Laguna. She and three others were meeting the last night in Los Angeles. They had some Mexican dish and a glass of bread, and she had two cigarettes. Then all of a sudden she said, What is this strange feeling? Oh, what a strange feeling. And he said, Oh, this way is just gone. Just completely gone. But she is awake. She is awake when she was there. So she steps from mortality into immortality. All the others who will sit like that or after painful exit, they are restored to life just as they were before. In a body, same as before, only young. Unbelievably, unaccountably young in a world just like this. But not this one. She is gone into heaven. Because she was born from above. So far, she has the immediate transition to a body of flesh and blood to one of God in the body of God, which is the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. So I have no tears to shed for none, because he is the release of a body. It was a nice body. It was in pain. It was that moment in time when she said, and she was born. All the others, death is a blessing to everyone who has not been born of above. You know why? It compels everyone who dies to modify and quite often to radically alter the ideas that champion while they were here on earth. So they believe because of their external efforts to be good, that suddenly someone will come and meet them at the grave and find themselves restored to life and young, unaccountably young, and new. Nothing missing, no teeth missing, hair not missing, arms not missing, everything is perfect. In a world just like this, to continue the journey. And then they wonder, what did that miracle tell me? What did that priest tell me about what follows? Well, he was a liar. No, he was a liar only because he didn't know. The blind leading the blind. No man can ordain you to do the work of God. You either seem to do it, or you shall be able to have some little man made religion and call it God given. As you're told in the book of Romans, how can someone preach unless he's sick? And who sent him? The risen Christ Jesus. So you stand in his presence and you're saved. And when you speak, when you speak with your thought and experience, you're not rationalized. You're not in any way stuck What ought to be? 
the following leaders of uh, different groups, religious groups, they are telling God what is God to do. All what he ought to do, not what God is planning to do. So the tell is going to make you suffer, and they will not preach the God of love. God is infinite mercy, but man has to pass through the furnaces of experience, not the furnaces of fire that they talk about, it, but the furnaces of experience. If you know many ways of burning, like losing someone you love, there, a mother losing a child, it doesn't go off in the night or the day or the week or the month or even the year. That's burning. A separation between two good of each other. Isn't that burning? When you can't sleep, you're all carried away. That's burning. That's a fire. That's hell. So you're in hell right now. All day long, the loss of a business, the loss of face. A man has a business and he's so proud of it. So he's the best club. And he's looked stuff at everyone who can't get in the back club. Then he comes a blow and he loses the business. And he can't afford to remain in the club. And he has to beg now for credit, but he has no credit. Goes to the grocer, where he was so proud before, and the grocer considered whether he'll be better or not. Now, isn't that hell? So, all these are the hell, the terms that through which man passes right here on earth. And when he leaves this hell, and as we fall from above, he continues in hell until that cross is completely woke and it's worn by Christ Jesus. Because Christ Jesus is I am that and he's wearing this cross. When it's turned to dust, he will still find himself on a cross. Just like this, that bleeds if you cut it, that is solid as this is solid. In a world as solid as this world is solid. And he continues, and if he passes through another stage called death, he finds himself restored to life. And continuing the journey until he resurrects. There's a vast difference between restoration and resurrection. Resurrection is from above, the birth to above. Restoration is simply the passage through the gate called death to be restored into a similar body that young, unaccountably new. So I tell you, the pattern is easy. Don't pay for it, it's easy. The perfect pattern. And Jesus Christ is not a man. He is the man. The only man that saves. He's in you as a pattern, the pattern man. And when you least expect it, this will be run like a seed. And then the flowers will take place in the most dramatic form. The flowers being these mystical dramatic acts. The birth, the discovery of the fatherhood of God, the tearing of the curtain of the temple with your own body, the descent of your own being into heaven as a servant, and then the descent of the double back, smothering you with love and affection, which is the symbol of the Holy Spirit satisfying with the work that is done. As the seal of truth, the whole thing unfolds within you. The other When you are awakened from above, there is no doubt whatsoever in your mind. Yes. If you saw someone who made this regard in this world, that's not resurrection, that's restoration. speaks of two birds, one dead. But one death doesn't mean that you depart this world now, but that is death, because you can continue your world and also die. So the death, when Christ died for us, that was the death of which he spoke in the Bible. There's only one death, it's God's death. So Christ took us all in his body, and Christ fell for us. So one we die, that's the death. The little departure from here is like someone leaving the stage. And you'll find it goes through this, but he comes back, but you never see you. That's restoration. But this is simply the one death, and the only one who really died was the Lord 
Jesus Christ. He died. That's the reason. It's not a resurrection, but I will speak to those that are restored because I love them, but they're not resurrected. I meet people, I have the night who are restored. I see my brother who died two years ago, my brother Lawrence. He's a young man now. He died, he was painfully ill. And he looked old. He's only a year older than I am. But he looked much older because he was in his pain for the last year and a half, two years of his life. But Lawrence, I mean, he was in his twenties, early twenties. My mother, when she died at 61, was painfully ill and oh, so very old looking. When she died, I was sitting at home in New York City. At that moment, I felt so drowsy, I could not be seen the impulse to close my eyes. So I shut my eyes just because I couldn't hold them open. As I gave mother here before me, this long blue eyed beauty of 20 years of age, brushing her hair, sitting on a bunch of a of beautiful flowers, she was passionate upon the flowers. And the most glorious house, those days, I can see her now morning after morning with these two boys that were part of the gardeners and giving them orders of what to do, especially with the roses. And she would wrap the roses and do all kinds of things. She loved them. I can see her in the garden now with her, what she called a parasol. She wouldn't expose herself to the sun as I did. I was so keen and she loved to keep her lovely coconut skin. And she had a lovely light skin and blue eyes and long hair. Yeah. She wanted to spin with the tropical sun. When we, the boys, were going to explain us, we were out in the sea, back, coming in sunburn. And yet to this day, in my 60s, I'm still, uh, in a way, a wish for the sun, that lovely sun. But he was mother, she came at that very moment. She was so alive and marvelous. I sat right down and I wrote my sister down. And I told her, Mother has. Uh, recovered. She was so beautiful and so young. And Daphne sent me a while, said Mother's best word. Then she wrote me the letter for the paper to give me the details of my Mother's message. It coincided with the hour that I saw in New York City, 2,000 miles away. So I know the experience that nothing died. The Mother wasn't resurrected, she was restored. And they're not in her tomb, I tell you. And they work there too, and they're safe there too, and they build their little castles on sand there, as they do it here. Amazon right now is restored as a young man with the same drive. He left his $700 million there last month. Couldn't take it with him, but he's going to rebuild it on the same sand. Until that moment in time, when he awakes, and the whole is he doesn't have to do anything. But my dear. Any other questions, please? Oh, yeah. By serving my dear, I have done support. I have to meet Caesar's demands about the pain tank. I have no choice but to pay them. They don't ask me if they should raise them. You put a man in who promises you before you put him in, he's not going to raise that. He hasn't sat down in the seat before he puts another 10% on you, that's 30% on you, and he has four years, you can't get it up. And he's going to put it on you. And so I am in the world. So I go into a place and that's where I went in. I bought something that cost me so much. I go back expecting the same thing to find that they don't consult me. It's so much more. No, even after what you paid for flour and sugar and bread 10 years ago, you're going to say. Go and say it. You're going out and you buy the same item, and all of a sudden, you don't have it. So, I'm in the same world. As long as I wear this garment, it's the same. And I must be with all the same. When I take this garment off for the last time, which we just in this environment, I am immediately clothed in my body of glory, in the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I am one with him, without the loss of identity. But until then, man has to pass through the furnace. I pray the world of Caesar. And Caesar is in there. They call him today, in our land, Johnson. They call him in uh, Russia, they call him by some other, uh, I don't know, I'm going to my tongue to spell it, but whatever Russian he is. So all these powers are the seasons of the world. Every type of government is seasons. 
deceptions. Many are the seasons of dangerous And so, I have pain to you, I have the grief to many. Who knows I may have a pain? I am not given over because I have been born for God, that I can violate the little things of season. If I overeat because I like it, but I pay the price. Do all the things I am not a sin. This body is something that I am good with. And as long as I obey you, I will take care of it, abuse it, but I abuse it, don't ever get eaten. And that's the law in which you live. Now, the only one is going to come to the Father through the perfect man known as the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a pattern man. Don't let them be as a man, but the pattern man. And that pattern either will be followed or he will never find the Father. For the Father's only son is David, and it isn't Buddha. And it isn't Krishna. And it isn't any other name in the world. That son is David. The other comes through that shadow, for he doesn't find the Father. For David can call anyone but God, Father. And he isn't going to call a Buddha Father, or Krishna Father, or anyone else. He's going to call the one whose name is I am. And so you will come and see the one that and no man comes under the Father except by me. I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. It's the true way, the living way, and the only way. And these things will be rough for things. So when they come to me, all kinds of ways to go to God. Some try to sell me the idea of dust to go to God. Stop eating meat. I know that. Then you kill it by yourself and you go to God. Stop doing this. Don't go to God anymore. Because that's a bad thing that I'll tell them. It doesn't mean to the God. The Spirit will say, One lady would only wear a certain color because it would become the first thing I told her. So she made it as well. And it's some divine revelation. You bring her to the when you eat onions. Well, can you imagine cooking without onions? Just imagine having to cook without a piece of dough. Without onions. One of them, she can't remember being done as candle all over the sky. See a sunset. What a beautiful picture. A sunset. That's mad, lots of rain. Don't do any garden and see rain. And God does with all the colors that the honest can do. He brings all the colors into one flower. That is beautiful. But we can't put rain with this and some like that. So they have all these little things. Yet the Bible warns you against them. And Jesus said, I cannot eat the unclean thing. He got into a trance, and a sheep came down bearing all manner of food. And the Lord said to him in vision, That which I have cleansed, I have cleansed, lay and eat. So they can eat this, they can eat that. If it, if it disagrees with it, don't say it is unspiritual. He made everything for the food of man. Someone said, Why do you even think? You're a man, and you're supposed to be a man born to love. And you take it deep. I said, because I enjoy it. But she said, uh, that's not spiritual. But the truth is to tell me what is true. Didn't God make it? Who on earth made alcohol? Did he make it in the grain? And then gave man the intelligence to touch it? Did he make it in the grain? And then gave man the intelligence to take it out? And you tell me not to exercise the power that he gave me? So I can endow it, I can overdo anything at this point. There is a thing that one eats that is good for you, but you cannot go to the extreme and make it unwholesome for it. I suppose that almost everything is good in itself, but eat excessively and see if it is. So the thing goes to something that's good. There is a limit. I must become discriminated in all my thoughts in this world. But then he tell me that there are chaplains on things that God made. He made everything for man, and he made man for his own satisfaction. Well, the time is up. And so, until...